And a lot of people don't agree with that. And usually it's the people who don't speak in tongues, right? Because they have an issue with their faith. They overthink it or something like that. Or they haven't been taught correctly how to receive it. I've never met someone who wanted to speak in tongues, be filled with the Holy Spirit, the evidence of speaking in tongues, right? And they didn't get it after I sat down with them. Never have met one person. There is really no shortage of people out there who really aren't qualified to be leading people, to be teaching people. The issue sometimes boils down to if a person is kind of teaching bad doctrine or false doctrine, are they doing so out of ignorance or are they doing so willfully for their own benefit? And sometimes you can be doing it for your own benefit in an ignorant fashion. I think when we talk about Marcus Rogers, I think it's more ignorance. It's more um, just being unlearned than anything else. Um, it seems like, I'm not sure, but it might seem like he might have a genuine heart, um, but he's just doing so uh, in a fashion, in a way that he just doesn't know he needs to probably be taught by someone. It may be that he just needs to have someone to teach him, to train him. He's not young. Uh, I believe he's in his 30s, I, I believe. And I'm not sure of his background. I think he has a musical background. I don't know a whole lot about him, his past, but I do know this. He's got a pretty good following on YouTube. There's over 500 plus thousand people that have subscribed to him. And this is why this requires discussing him and his doctrine and some of the things that he says is because some people are buying what he's saying. Some people are buying what he's selling. And so without going too far into it, let's just examine some of the things that he said and show why there's a big red flag, why there's a cause for concern for anyone who is following or listening to Marcus Rogers. Anybody that has the spirit of God, who truly has the spirit of God, you can identify, all right, when someone else has the spirit of God. You might not agree with them on everything, but you know, you sense that they are filled with the spirit. The Bible says, my sheep know my voice. Is that really a legitimate way to determine if someone is maybe a false teacher or teaching some things falsely? Well, it depends on who you're talking to. So if you ask me and I say that my spirit is telling me that you're not uh, a, a true teacher, that there's something false about you, then are you going to accept that? See, you now have set yourself up as the arbiter of what's good, what's bad, what's true, what's false because of your spirit or really code word, your feelings, how you feel. So when you when you say that anyone who has the spirit of God can sense or can tell, that's not always the case, which is why we are supposed to adhere to sound doctrine, which is why we're supposed to study. And the way we test the spirits is by the word that the Holy Spirit gave us. The problem is Marcus Rogers hadn't been taught that. I suspect that he's not necessarily had any formal training. I don't mean really maybe seminary. I mean, just somebody, some man, some older person, someone with some wisdom, someone with the ability to kind of cut through the scriptures and to execute a passage properly, who knows a little bit about the history of the times and so forth, uh, a little bit about the languages. Maybe he hadn't had, it doesn't sound like he's had anyone to kind of pour into him in that regard because he makes a statement. He has stated that you can tell that he is legitimate based on what he can show as what he thinks is proof that he is of God. Matthew 7, 16, 20, you should know them by their fruits. Do man gather grapes of thorns or figs and thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a, cup, a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not good fruit is hewn down and cast in the fire, wherefore by their fruits you shall know them. I'm going to tell you straight up, anybody that says Marcus Rogers is a false prophet or of the devil, they don't have the spirit of God. Period. There's no way you can have the spirit of God. And here's the sad thing, right? If you're saying that about me, I go harder for Jesus. I go hard. And this ain't pride. Come on. People know, you know, that I really go hard for the kingdom. I'm working hard for the kingdom. I'm in the streets. I'm trying to build schools. I've been uh, doing so many different things over the years. And the people who critique me, they don't have fruit that they can stack up against my fruit. That's not pride. It's biblical. The fruit speaks for itself. The Bible says the spirit will bear witness and that you will know them by their fruit. 
I always find it interesting that a lot of people that critique me and attack me, they don't have, you know, 5% of the fruit that I have for the kingdom. So anyone that says that he's a false prophet, um, that we don't have the spirit. No, Marcus, you are, and let me just be honest with you, straightforward, biblically illiterate. You do not know the scriptures. And you're saying that because you've got a following, that that means something, that that is proof that you are of God. Well, let me just give you a rundown of some people that had a big following as well. Let's look at maybe the founder of the Nation of Islam. Let's look at the founder of Islam itself, Muhammad. Let's look at Charles Taze Russell, the founder of Jehovah's Witnesses. Let's look at Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormonism cult. There are a lot of people who have a big following, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are of God. Football teams have a big following. Rock stars and rappers and R&B singers have a big following. Doesn't necessarily mean that they are of God. When you look at the people with the largest social media following, that doesn't mean that they're because they have a large following and because people do what they say or what have you, that they are of God. And then when you start talking about maybe people that are in the body who seem to follow you, still the same thing. So there are some people out there who we know are off, but have a large following. Creflo Dollar, large following. Benny Hinn, large following. Are there some Christians, some real, true, born-again believers who follow some of these false prophets unknowingly? Sure they are, because they're not learning it themselves, and they're following someone who also is unlearned. And so why do I say that you, Marcus Rogers, is biblically illiterate, that he is unlearned? Well, let's look at some of the things that he says, and let's compare them to the scriptures. A lot of people don't want to hear because they're illiterate, you know what I'm saying, when it comes to the Bible. Isaiah, uh, this is why you need to be careful who you judge and who and what you say about people because only God really knows. Isaiah went and prophesied something to Hezekiah. He said, look, dude, you're about to die. Get your stuff together. Then based off of the reaction of Hezekiah, God stopped Isaiah and gave him a completely different prophecy, completely opposite. One was you're going to die. The next one was you're going to live and God's going to add on some more years to your life. Two different prophecies. OK, and the only way we would know that the second prophecy came to pass was, uh, you know, if they were there when Hezekiah died and if he lived the amount of years. So that would take some time to know. That's why you have to be careful, because prophecy all right, God can change his mind based on the actions of people, even though he's all knowing. That's a whole other subject to get into, but it's right there in the Bible. And so it's rich that he would say that people who disagree or don't see it the way he sees it, that they're biblically illiterate. No, my brother, you are. And we'll cover that in a second, this whole issue of biblical illiteracy. When you make the statement to try to defend yourself, and many of you know about the record of him, along with other people who had these false prophecies. Now, he'll say that he's, that he's not a prophet, but he gave a false prophecy. So in that regard, you acted in that role. You pretended to or claimed to speak for God, that God had put this on your heart and that you were true to it. You even said, I've heard that you would take some time off uh, either from social media or Facebook, or you, I'm not sure what it was, but you didn't do that. But that's neither here nor there. The point is that you were wrong in your attempt to try to speak for God and there was no humility in it. There was no, guys, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. I messed up. Um, no, you, you almost doubled down. And then when you say something like this, that you try to justify your error as to say that maybe Isaiah was in error also, or that maybe he wasn't in error, but God changed his mind. Well, here's the difference between you and Isaiah. God tells Isaiah to tell Ezekiel the next portion. You didn't come and say that God told you to tell us that on second thought, Biden is going to win. No, but you're trying to find a way out. That to anyone else with any sort of level of any maturity can identify that as pride. You're too proud to admit that I'm wrong. And in saying something like this, that you had this false prophecy, even though you want to call yourself a prophet, but this false prophecy would require you to take some time off, to sit back and reevaluate yourself. But no, what you've got going, you feel is too big for that. You don't need seasoning. You feel like that you can just trust the spirit. So let's look at some of the other things that you've said that 
tells us that people who follow you need to beware and probably ought to find someone else to follow and listen to. Right? And anybody who gets mad at this video or gets upset or starts arguing with this video, it's because they lack the faith to receive the gift and they haven't received it yet. And so they criticize anybody who's uh, walking in the full word of God. So check it out, Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, repent, one action, and be baptized, two actions, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's three separate actions. So anybody who tells you, oh, you don't have to be baptized, it says clearly that if you're not baptized, you will be damned in the Bible and Mark, and it's not talking about... Um, being baptized in the Holy Spirit. You see here, it's three separate actions. You repent, uh, you were baptized, and then you receive the Holy Ghost. Then you receive the Holy Spirit. Mark 16, 17, and these signs, this is the important one, and these signs will accompany those who believe. These signs will. Some versions say, these signs shall. Uh, accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will speak if you believe you will speak in new tongues so you have stated that mark because of mark 16 and acts 238 that 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 tells us that when a person um has the holy spirit the evidence of it is speaking in tongues and that they shall speak in tongues well let's see if that's really what the scriptures say and these signs will accompany those, or as you said, shall follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, and they will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And so the interesting thing about this passage that you're, that you're referring to is you're referring to the, the tongues portion. You're saying that they shall do this, but you don't talk about the other things they shall do according to this passage. They shall pick up snakes. They shall cast out demons. I don't see you doing that. I don't see you casting out devils. I don't see you laying hands. These are things that you say that this passage says that they shall do. And so what gives with you? So why aren't we saying that the evidence is picking up serpents or the evidence is casting out demons? You don't say that. Why? Because we'll soon find out that you don't have that power as well. And, and God forbid for someone to say that Marcus Rogers doesn't have the spirit because he's not casting out demons and he's not laying on of hands and he's not handling serpents. Because that's not what that passage is saying in the first place. And the issue it goes back to whether that passage even belongs, but we'll leave that alone for now. But then you point to Acts 2.38. And so when Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so you're saying, Marcus is saying that there are three things that are going to happen. One, repent. That's one thing. Two, be baptized. And three, receive the Holy Spirit. Well, they're not three separate things. It's what we said before, this exegetical chi, which is a way of saying one thing using two or three or four different ways of saying it. And so it's not saying three different things are going to happen. These things are all going to happen. And so the better way of understanding is that repent and be baptized goes together. Um, <clears throat> every one of you and you shall receive in doing so you receive the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit comes um, on you as you are baptized, as you repent. And so when a believer comes to Christ, they already have a, they have a repentant heart. You cannot come to Christ. You cannot be baptized in the spirit without a repentant heart. That happens. That comes together. It's a simultaneous action. It's not a second work or a second action. But the fact that you don't understand how scripture is laid out and that acts is not a prescriptive. It is descriptive of how the church started because, again, you have not been taught this. And then speaking about baptism, you have the stance that baptism, if a person is water baptized and that they must be water baptized for salvation. I believe that's what you're saying, if I'm not mistaken, and that in doing so, when a person is water baptized, they must have the word spoken over them in the name of Jesus. They cannot have in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you say, because that's the only way that we see it done by the apostles. Well, you misunderstand what it means to have something done in the name of. It means upon the reputation based on what you're doing. And if we were to take it literally, then why did Jesus say to do it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Again, 
your lack of understanding and your biblical illiteracy is causing a problem here. You do not believe that once a person is a believer that their salvation is kept. And one of the things that you refer to is Matthew. You refer to the Olivet Discourse when he's talking about, uh, when he makes a statement in Matthew that the one who endures to the end shall be saved. But you don't understand that that's something having to do with the end times. He's speaking about what's happening during this great tribulation, about this prophecy relating to Israel. But you miss that because, again, you have not been taught. This isn't something that, that requires even a seminary level understanding. Just read the passage in context and we see that's clearly what Jesus is talking about. And then when confronted on the Trinity or God's triune existence, rather than giving a good defense, your only course is to resort to saying, well, it's not a heaven or hell issue. Well, lay that to the side for just a second, whether it's a heaven or hell issue, the fact of the matter is you trying to be a leader and a teacher, you should know these things and you should have a better defense that, well, it's not as important though. Well, it is important because it's in the scriptures. And so for you to make light of it because you can't give a good defense, well, then maybe you just ought to admit that I'm wrong. Again, further proof that you ought to step back and take on some training. Because whether you believe it's a heaven or hell issue, it certainly is an issue that whether you know it or not would disqualify you from teaching or leading if you cannot give a defense of what it is that you're saying. But what you do is you kind of retreat and you say things like, they attack Jesus, so they're going to attack me as though you're kind of in that same vein, that you are spiritually that adept, uh, that you are that spiritually mature. No, you're not. Here's one thing that's difficult to find. It's difficult to find anybody with sound doctrine backing up what you say, what Marcus Rogers says. You're not going to find someone with any sort of theological heft to them with some sort of with any sort of theological brains, the ability to, to execute a passage properly. You're not going to find any of those people saying that that Marcus Rogers, he's spot on. You're not going to find that. And so I'm probably more inclined to believe that the reason for your errors uh, in understanding scriptures and stating what you're stating has more to do with your head than your heart. Meaning this, I think you're probably just honestly ignorant of the scriptures. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be ugly here but I'm just trying to be as, 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 as straight, straightforward as possible. I think that your reasons for having these errors have to, everything to do with the fact that you just don't know the Bible, that you have some biblical illiteracy, some things that you need to straighten up. I don't think it's necessarily a hard issue that you are intentionally trying to be deceptive. It could be, but I don't think so, which is a good thing. The problem is, though, you've got to get past this other hard thing that you're dealing with, and that is pride. You don't want to let anyone tell you that you're wrong and because you've gotten more followers and because people are latching on to you that you're doing OK, that it must be of God. But again, that can't be the barometer when people who know the scriptures and have searched the scriptures and have studied the scriptures can all say, hey, listen, brother, you're making errors right here. And you don't want to listen when an older brother in the Lord wants to tell you this. And I've seen it happen where they've talked to you and you still don't want to listen. Well, that's a red flag. And that's further cause for someone else to say, you know what? This guy's not even willing to follow, so why should we follow him? Why should we follow his lead? Marcus, you are in error spiritually and biblically. For you to turn around and start trying to prove your point and say that what you say, um, people don't have 5% of the fruit that you have, well, maybe you need to start asking some of these people who, who disagree with you what kind of fruit they have. Marcus, again, you haven't been at this very long, and I get it that you're kind of maybe in an echo chamber and you're hearing people tell you how great you are and how this and how that. But brother, from an older brother to, uh, to a younger brother, I'm telling you, you are out of line. You are um, using the scriptures in an incorrect fashion. You do not seemingly know how to execute a passage, but you instead want to find passages to prove your point or to back you up. That makes you a dangerous teacher. And for that reason, people who listen to Marcus Rogers, the 500 plus thousand people who subscribe to him and those who are on Facebook and every other social media platform who may go to his, I think his church, uh, you need to be aware of him. He's just not ready. I don't know if he'll ever be ready. Uh, if he doesn't do anything about his pride, well then no, he won't be. And well, what comes before the fall? Pride. I can testify to this personally. Marcus, you are not ready. People who listen to him, guys, beware.
You're wrong on tongues. You're wrong on baptism. You're wrong on the means of why a person has to be baptized. You're wrong on eternal security. You're wrong on the Trinity. You're wrong on a great number of things. And so, Marcus, listen, do us, do yourself a favor. I believe it's your head, not your heart. You've made so many basic scriptural errors. You need to just take a step back. And for everyone else, until he does, you simply need to avoid him. Amen.